Welcome to She Said Homestead, the podcast that explores homesteading from a range of perspectives. We're Sage and Michaela, two homesteaders, each with unique experiences, properties, and future goals for our homesteads. We're discussing various homesteading topics, sharing our personal experiences as women working full-time who are managing homesteads as well, and shining a light on the stories of other inspiring homesteaders. Before we dive in, be sure to hit that subscribe button so you never miss an episode. And if you enjoy our podcast, please consider leaving a review. It really helps us grow and share these homesteading stories with even more people. Hey guys, welcome back to the podcast. I'm Sage from Terra Nova Acres. And I'm Michaela from Calico Nova Acres. And we both have homesteads in Western North Carolina. Today, we're going to be talking about our garden updates. It's that time of year, everything's in the ground and starting to grow. So thought we would spend some time on that. But before we get into all of that, tell me a little bit about your week, Michaela. This is a hard question this week because I feel like I always gravitate towards garden updates. And I want to save that for the actual episode. This week, I was a solo homesteader for a few days. Taylor left me for four days to go up to Michigan. So I was holding down the fort here by myself. And it was the real feel for a couple days straight was 105 degrees while he was gone. That was really rough. I was feeding the birds frozen watermelon like frisbees. Like I sliced it into just big circles and I was feeding them frozen, frozen ones and trying to keep them cool. Trying to keep me cool. I was staying inside until it was almost dark out. So I did get some inside things done. I think two weeks ago, I got a box of chicken from the salvage store. And I finally got it thawed and had time to deal with it. It's, it ended up being like 45 pounds of whole chickens. It was 12 of them. And it was $10 for the what? whole box. <laughs> yeah. It was $10 for the entire box. It was like, it was so heavy that I was having a hard time holding it. And um, yeah, it was 12 chickens. I parted out 11 of them. I left one of them whole. So I have like 11 dinners worth of chicken thighs, 11 dinners worth of chicken breasts. I have uh, a few nights worth of wings and I think three giant bags of like the carcasses for making broth and stuff later on because I was not about to turn any sort of heating device on (laughs) during the hot days this weekend uh not about to can some broth so I just threw them in the freezer for later so 45 pounds worth of chicken for ten dollars it was roughly 45 pounds and I'm pretty excited about that it was really cool I cleaned my house which that's really rare right now that didn't that hasn't happened for a while uh mostly because meg and ben were dropping off my azure order and i knew they were gonna come inside i was like it's a hot mess in here i need to clean this up a little bit (laughs) so i got it cleaned and then also i wanted it to be nice for taylor once he got home he came home sunday night and i was like i just want to relax and watch gilmore girls and have pizza and not worry about having a messy house so i like meal prepped and everything for the week and it rained finally (laughs) Finally, he got home. Well, okay, so he left on Thursday and it started to sprinkle that morning a little bit and I got really excited. And then the whole rest of the weekend, it was like teasing me. I was looking at the radar, the the storms, I'm not even kidding. They were coming straight for us. And then as soon as they hit like 10 minutes from our area, they split and went right around us. Every single one of them, or they just like dissipated. And I was like, we need this rain. Please stop. And I could see the clouds and it was thundering for the like three days straight and it didn't rain almost the entire time. We got a little bit sprinkled Thursday. And every time he leaves, we always get like a torrential downpour and like the power goes out and I'm always expecting like some big storm. So I was like, okay, I can deal with the power being out if it rains. Like I just want some rain. (laughs) And he got home at like 630 on Sunday. And within an hour of him getting home, torrential downpour. What were you up to not garden related this week? Well, I was also making sure to water things. I have one, you know, that sprinkler head that you think of that you like played in when you were a kid in the yard and it just goes one way and then it goes the other way. I have one of those and I just drag that over at the homestead for whatever I need to water. I mean, I was at the point where I was also watering 
the pasture so that the sheep would have forage when I was bringing them back to it. And I'm on, you know, the grass gets a five week break. So it was, it was struggling. It was not growing. Um, and I also finally got rain this weekend. I got like an inch or so over a couple storms. So that was helpful. And I no longer trust the forecast when it says Ch- chance of thunderstorms for the next, you know, whatever. I'm like, okay, we'll see. Um, so I don't know the next time that it's going to rain, but in theory, maybe, maybe in a couple days, uh, not holding my breath. But other than watering, um, I've honestly been doing things outside the homestead more because for the last two months at least it's been pretty non-stop and I finally hit the point where I didn't have anything on my list of like absolute critical blinking red light half to do this task and I was like I can I can relax like I can I can back off a little bit I can live my life outside of garden <laughs> for a few days. This is great. Uh, So that's what I've been doing. I've been trying to enjoy other aspects of my life outside of the homestead. So I've been talking a big game about trying to get more organized and like meal prep again. And this is the first week that I've been able to do that. So that felt really good. And then this is also the first week that I've gotten to the gym more than once which is a big deal for my mental health. And that's really helpful. And then once I start in that pattern, I'm like, I love the gym. Why am I not in here all the time? So we'll see. Maybe that'll become a lasting pattern. (laughs) I don't know. I don't know if I'll have time. But um, it's felt good this week to kind of feel more me and have my identity outside of homestead stuff. I feel like I've finally gotten to that point two or I'm almost to that point where I can kind of take a breather but it feels like I'm a month behind like I I feel like I should have been at this point a month ago Memorial Day should have been when I feel like this (laughs) where I'm like okay I can I have everything planted I should be able to just like weed and like leisurely do garden things now and I'm finally getting there and it feels nice all right now on to the things that we actually want to talk about which is always the garden (laughs) uh when we're recording this We are at the very beginning of July, so you guys will hear this later, but this is the the condition of our gardens at the very, very beginning of July. Um, At least I kind of feel like we're on the precipice of that season where you walk into your garden one morning and you're like, oh my gosh, everything is eight feet tall and the weeds are a jungle and I have more produce than I can pick. It's kind of like right on the edge of that right now. I would say the overall condition of my garden right now is a little bit thirsty and could be more lush if it was not as thirsty as it is. Yeah, this this season has been odd because both of our last frost dates were almost a month in advance. I got I got a small frost after I thought I was through it. So I don't know. There's <laughs> more, more complications in there. But it was an early season. It got hot so fast this year. Um, we started the season with it wouldn't stop raining. And now we're in a spell of it's incredibly dry. And so it's been stressors on, you know, the opposite ends of the spectrum. And I feel like because it got warm faster this year or earlier this year, I think that gave the bugs a head start. And so the the bug pest schedule is a little bit different than what I'm used to seeing Uh, And so it's just, it's harder for me to predict things. I feel like the plants, even though they kind of got a head start, are a little stressed right now, at least in my garden. Now, you know, saying all of that, I still have a huge garden with a bunch of plants that are, fingers crossed, knock on wood, still going to give me a bunch of food. I don't, I don't want to make it seem like it's you know, a terrible situation, but just being upfront about the challenges that we're having right now and also upfront about our plants could definitely be happier. I would say this year for me is a little bit different than last year for sure. 
and th I only have two years here to compare. So last year, spring was wet, but it was a lot less wet than this spring. And June was dry, but it was a lot less dry. <laughs> so it was a lot more mild than this this season. And that's not something I expected. I was expecting it to be kind of similar, which, I mean, you never know what to expect, right? But the lack of frosts, the temperature, and the the water are all have all been kind of major stressors. Stressors, I can't say that word. Have all been <laughs> major stressors on my garden this year. And I wasn't really prepared for that to be such a big deal. Yeah, as my memory serves for the last two years that I've been here, so this is my third growing season in this curtain garden. The last two years, May has been decently wet. June, there's been a there's been frequent storms, but nothing, you know, torrential. July tends to be really dry for me, and then August it will not stop raining. So this year is a lot different. I mean, it was still really wet in May, but then June was like no precipitation at all and then and then a lot warmer so going into july i hope that it's not also really really dry in july which i can water right like i have resources that i can throw at it but it's it's a lot more active management and i don't actually usually water my garden at all so for me to water was kind of a big deal i'm worried about july too just based on last year so it seems like it kind of goes in an, in a month on, a month off pattern, where like a month, May is rainy, June is dry, and then here in July, we typically, and this is me basing off it, me basing this off of like me looking other people's experiences up and looking up weather data in the past and stuff, July is typically very wet here in terms of it's really, really hot and sunny all day long afternoon hits we get a, an hour or two thunderstorm and then it's 75 the rest of the night and that's amazing because i never have to water in like i i wouldn't have to water in july but last year we hit august and by like early to mid august we didn't get rain until november like it rained maybe once from august to november and so i'm really worried with june that we're not going to get any rain come july august september etc I'm I'm really concerned about that. That makes me want to get my watering coat set up so that if it does rain, I can like harvest the rainwater and not have to pay to water the garden, but also like maybe moving drip lines or whatever up to a lot sooner than I planned. I was planning to do those next year, like over the winter, get that stuff set up. But if it keeps being this, we might have to adjust that a little bit. Right. And... This this drought isn't just North Carolina. I mean, I was talking to my dad in he's in Atlanta. It hasn't rained there for I don't know, I want to say 6 weeks and it's been even hotter there than it is here. So, they'll have temperatures in the mid 90s like almost every day plus no rain and things are things are crispy. So it's it's not just, you know, our little North Carolina bubble um there's crazy weather everywhere and then in the midwest it's flooding so it's it's been it's been really crazy um kind of no matter where you are in the u.s for the last few weeks i feel like we should try and go over like some of the improvements or changes we made to our gardens that were taking into account weather in previous years so like for me i tried to mulch everything a lot more this year including the pathways to hold that water in because we had such a dry like late summer and then I would say adding the raised beds was also kind of an improvement to be able to let our carrots grow but also so they're not in like a a wet soggy soil all the time that those drain really easily those are like the main improvements to our main garden that we did and then I guess doing root stout style beds where the weeds pop up less, that just helps in general. But are there any improvements that you made? The only, I'll call it structural improvement that I made was digging some drainage trenches when back <laughs> when it wouldn't stop raining. And a bunch of my plants got flooded out. Like the first melons and squashes that I planted drowned 
and then my tomatoes kind of got a rough a rough start not only because of that hailstorm that just KO'd some of them <laughs> but any of the ones that survived the hail uh were kind of just steeping in water for a while and they now have fungus issues that I think they're gonna have pretty much all season um since since it started I, I'm not getting rid of it at this point so really digging that drainage trench through the bottom half of my garden is the only thing that I've done you know other than that it's been hoping that as I'm adding organic material that as I'm continuing to cultivate these spaces that as I'm adding mulch which I like to mulch with hardwood mulch as I'm doing all those things that it's going to slowly improve every year just because I don't have the time, the money, or the energy to do big changes, you know. It's just me. I could totally ask for help if I wanted to, but I like being stubborn, and I like this being my project and my baby and doing it exactly how I want to without um, having to answer to anybody else. So <laughs> that's how I'm doing it. So I'm curious how your new flower beds like down in the front yard area are doing their first year since it's been a wild year with the weather. <laughs> yeah. Okay. So that's, that's a good question because I'm doing slightly different tactics. So for anyone who's not familiar with my layout, I have two different garden spaces. One is the food garden, which is normally what I'm talking about. That's up in the pasture. I put that in a sacrifice paddock. So it's where they had their horses. It was really compacted because that's where they had their horses for a long time. There's no topsoils, just awful, atrocious. I'm rehabbing that and turning that into a garden space because I'm a little bit crazy. Um, and then there is the flower garden, which is basically my front yard. And it's because I didn't want to mow grass. So I am converting it into a flower space. The food garden, I did broad fork. So the food garden is not no dig, but I do count it as no till. I moved earth around just enough to grade it, but I've never, like, I, I don't take a tiller to those beds and, and till them to break them up. I, I use, a, I have used a broad fork in the food garden. The flower garden is not only no till, but it is totally no dig. So there are some raised beds simply for the fact that um the yard is sloped and i've tried to grow on that slope and the flowers get very sad and they tilt over so <laughs> i put some beds in there uh, to sort of flatten that out um and then the other side i just threw mulch down in the winter and that was <laughs> the most that i did to it it's doing pretty well. So the side that I just threw mulch down, that I didn't do anything special, didn't do anything fancy, that is at the toe of the slope where they had poured the horse manure for a few decades. So that that's really good soil and things drain through there. It's kind of ideal it's probably it's probably honestly the best soil on my entire property so the things over there are really loving it the only drawback to that spot is that it is going to be the last place on my entire property that thaws in the winter and it's gonna be the first place that frosts um as winter's coming back so the season there is just shorter because of topography the raised beds on the flower garden side the ones that are deep that I filled with like leaf mulch and food compost and all kinds of stuff because I didn't want to buy fill dirt because I'm a little bit broke. Um, those are doing well. I put my dahlias in there. I would have had a hard time if I was just, you know, throwing seeds in there because it's not it's not quite broken down enough. But the dahlias are big bulbs. And I had already pre-sprouted them. I kind of put soil in there when I was putting them in. So they're good. <laughs> Not to get too convoluted. But there's so many different like conditions. The other raised beds that are very shallow. So I only kept them raised to contain basically the mulch that I was putting on there. Those suck. Uh, they are terrible. Which is not uncommon for a first year garden space. I threw mulch down to try to kill the grass. But... It just wasn't, I don't know. 
It just wasn't great soil. It's not terrible soil. Um, the grass was in the process of dying back. I had just put the wood chips in, which sometimes, you know, if wood chips get a little bit mixed in with your soil, they can deplete the nitrogen. So it's just like, it's just not established. So the first things that I threw in there weren't great, but I think, I think all of those spaces, all of those no dig flower garden spaces are going to be fantastic next year. This year, what are the main things that you're growing in your garden? Maybe maybe that's several things. Our focus this year, we were trying to make peppers and tomatoes, which I feel like that's probably going to be an every year thing. But I'd say peppers, tomatoes, heavy on the melons and squash, and then root crops. But we already harvested a lot of our first round of root crops. So my garden kind of feels empty right now, which is weird. I know that like it's aligned with my plan and it's like part of secession planting things. But I'm kind of nervous to film a garden tour in a couple days because I'm like, I don't even have much growing right now. Like it's in the garden, but you can't see it because I just replanted so many things. I guess. Okay. So our peppers were like, the main focus. And we put those in a couple beds at the bottom of the garden and they immediately, like half of them died because they got drowned. (laughs) So we're like, scrap that plan. We're moving these things. We literally Marie Kondo'd the garden. We were like, get rid of this stuff, (laughs) reorganize it, put it in a better spot because that was not working. So those are flower beds now and extra tomato beds. Um, But since we've moved the peppers, they're a lot better. We did lose a few more uh, just because I think I didn't get them in the ground soon soon enough. They were just sitting in duck poop water, but that's my own fault. I've started to harvest peppers over the last few days. I just ate a lunchbox pepper tonight for the first time, and that was the most flavorful bell pepper or sweet pepper, I guess, that I've ever tasted in my life. That was delicious. I haven't had any pest issues on those yet that I've noticed, and they seem to have recovered from the water issues mostly. And all of the ones that I planted from my own starts that I was like nervous about that were two inches tall when I planted them because I thought I stunted them, they're all like bushes now, and they're doing better than any of the nursery bought ones. So I'm pretty, I'm proud of that. (laughs) As you should be. What is your main crop of the year, I guess? Crops of the year. That's a good question. You know, this year I'm doing a lot more like bulk production. I'm slimming down my varieties compared to the past two years because I was experimenting previously to figure out what I like. And now I kind of know what I like. And I'm like, all right, (laughs) I'm just going to I'm just going to invest in this. But I think the main crop in my garden this year is tomatoes. For sure. I also have a ton of peppers. I mean, like that, that kind of makes sense. I think that's going to be pretty consistent. And that's, that's going to be the case for a lot of especially southern gardens. But I counted yesterday and I have, I think it's 71 tomato plants. I don't know how many pepper plants I have. But honestly, part of that is by accident. Part of that is I had a plant sale this year and hardly anybody came by. And then as soon as I gave up and I planted them in the ground, I had multiple people ask me, hey, do you have any more plants? And I was like, (laughs) no. Uh, So I ended up with a whole lot more than I intended to. But honestly, I'm not mad about it. And some of the plants that I ended up not intending to have in my garden and just planting in this, you know, kind of extra row at the end of my garden look the healthiest <laughs> out of any of them so i don't know i'm I'm not mad about it i was gonna say i watched your garden tour i saw all of those peppers you got a lot of peppers <laughs> well i have so many peppers because i grow stunted peppers i could get a couple hundred dollars worth of compost and grow not stunted peppers but again i'm a little bit broke so <laughs> i'm doing what i can with what i have I think we're going to end up getting another load of compost next, like this fall for next year so that we can do some, I don't know what to call them, but I just like to call them uh, like food forest, fruit tree guild worms. 
like fill in between them with like mulch piles of like with compost and stuff under them because I want to put more blueberry bushes and stuff down there but that's that's another topic all right so we are you know going into the thick of summer but I know that you have already harvested a bunch of things from the garden if I'm not mistaken you've already you've already done garlic and carrots and potatoes is there anything else Yeah, so we harvested carrots, onions, potatoes, leeks, and garlic scapes. Those are like the main things we harvested. Uh, A bunch of peas that I actually, like we either used some of them fresh or I didn't have time to preserve them. And they kind of just went to the birds or something. Honestly, did not preserve any of those this year. I'm going to try and do fall ones because that was a major fail on my part. Started to get some flowers. I've got zinnias, the gladiolus, sweet pea flowers, and some cosmos. And we're starting to get random flower things. All sorts of, like, herbs, pretty much. That's that's kind of the extent of what we've got so far. We've gotten some big harvests and then a lot of little harvests of herbs and flowers and other non-mean crops, I would say. Have you been harvesting things? Oh, yeah. Yeah, since the beginning of this year, starting with food, I pulled on my garlic, which we've talked about this before. I had a miserable garlic harvest because the sheep ate most of mine. But anyway, I pulled garlic out. I've pulled a, a handful of potatoes out so far. I keep thinking that, you know, the main crop of them is going to, you know, start turning yellow and die back, but they keep doing well. So I'm leaving them. But as as the plants kind of look sad, I'll pull them out, but nothing substantial on that front yet. I've been pulling a lot of chamomile out, which is kind of a continual harvest. It's not really a bulk thing that happens all at once. And so I'll pull a little bit of chamomile here and there. And echinacea, I am taking those flowers and drying them this year because you can make a tea out of the petals and flowers and things. It's edible from root to flower head so you can you can do all different kinds of stuff and i haven't fully researched it yet but i know that i'm gonna want to play around with that in the winter so it means i gotta do something with it right now i've grabbed a few shishito peppers that's really the only pepper that's ready so far the plants have green peppers on them but most of the varieties i wait until they you know turn orange or red or yellow or something other than green but shishitos you just gotta get big enough and then i pull them so i'll probably blister those to some sort of soy soy sauce honey something and uh eat them that way what else green onions lots of lettuce i had i tried to harvest spinach and got like two leaves but that didn't work well (laughs) um I've gotten the first few cherry tomatoes, which is fun. It's nothing more than like a garden snack right now, but that's that always feels good. You're like, it's close. I can feel it. I've also pinched the basil back. So I pinch it so that they get really bushy. And, you know, it's only a little nub of basil, but because I have like 50 basil plants, that ends up being a harvest that you got to do something with. Pulled turkey tail mushrooms off of the logs that line the beds, which total accident. I did not mean to grow turkey tail, but I grew a turkey tail. So <laughs> I'm harvesting it. I tried to grow onions. I failed at growing onions. I decided that I'm going, I, I was going to harvest them as onion sets to replant, to actually grow onions. Hopefully. So I pulled those out, but they don't really count because they're not food yet but (laughs) i think i think that's everything in the food garden so are you gonna plant those sets again in the fall or in the spring or do you not know i don't know i've (laughs) i've set it aside and um i haven't really thought about it or made a plan because i'm so frustrated (laughs) trying to grow onions this garden, I've grown in, I've grown them in two other garden spaces and they've done fine. And then this garden, it's just been not cooperating with me. Um, that's okay. <laughs> that's okay. It's part of gardening. It's, uh, it's never going to be perfect. I, I'm pretty surprised with how well some of our onions did, actually. I think 
with the rain and stuff we got, it, it really piled the dirt on. So they the dirt moved on top of them more as mud. So I think that they got buried a little deeper than they should have. But honestly, we got some decent sized onions. We got some big ones. And then we got a lot of, I would say, like small to medium onions. So I think if they had not been buried so deep, then they would have done better. And most of the good ones were from our starts. But we did... I do have some good ones out there from our sets, but a lot of the sets just bolted. So I don't know. I think I'm I'm on the starts train now. I think I like that the best so far because that was the easiest <laughs> and it was really cheap to do. Oh yeah, my tomatoes are still not very tall. Like I have not had to clip most of them to the trellis yet. And I don't know if it's because I planted them kind of late or... If it's just been so dry that they're not really taking off. But I keep waiting for that moment. You know the moment where you like turn around in the garden and then everything's six feet tall. And then you're like, oh my gosh, how did this happen? I keep waiting for that to happen and it hasn't happened yet. And I was looking through my pictures earlier today feeling like I'm behind with things. And I'm like, I wasn't harvesting my first ripe tomato for two more weeks last year. So I still giving it up some more time before I feel nervous about it. <laughs> right. I think if we get a week or two of good rainstorms, I think that's when it'll happen. Or I don't know if we have to artificially recreate that <laughs> with watering, but July really is the month where my garden tends to take off and then august is when i can officially no longer keep up with it and it's just it's jumanji for sure i was literally just gonna say it flips the switch to being like jungle mode like out of nowhere in july it just happens you don't even notice that it, it's happening and then all of a sudden everything is green around you and three times as tall i do have something i was gonna mention that i'm gonna try out for our main tomatoes and this is sort of an infrastructure thing, sort of a weather thing, because it's been so hot and sunny and dry. It's been almost 100 degrees. Like, it's been the actual temperature in the high 90s, mid 90s, and then the real feel every day has been like 101, 102, 105, 103. So my tomato leaves are all really curled because they're stressed right now because of that heat. Even though I'm constantly watering them, we're on city water, it's not well water, and it's just not as good as rainwater, and I have to move it around the garden, so they're not getting that like good saturation that I'd want them to get. So I have them placed this year in a spot in the garden where they are only one bed away from our long tunnel trellis, and they're adjacent as well in a, on the other side to our little trellis. And then there's a tree on the other side, on the north side of them. So they're in a perfect position to put a shade cloth over them if I want to clip it to all of those things. So I just ordered that and it should be here on this weekend, I think. And I'm going to do a kind of a triangle situation with a 50% shade cloth and see if that helps them because they are in full sun all day long and it's a hot a hot sun. <laughs> so that's a little experiment that I'm going to try. I have some tomatoes that aren't in that area. So we'll just kind of see how those ones do compared to the others. I think that will work well for you. Yeah, I'm I'm fortunate enough that I'm a little bit cooler than you. So I mean, I've had some some warm, real feels, but my tomatoes haven't hit that, you know, over 90 degree, like, I don't know, actual vegetation temperature like it's different for humans because we cool ourselves by yeah. evaporating air and that's why that real feel can be different but mine haven't hit that stress point but i have gotten shade cloth and used it for my lettuce which i usually struggle figuring out how to carry lettuce into the summer which if you garden in the south you can understand what that's like uh and i actually had some lettuce for lunch today and it was it was a little bitter but it was doable like once i put the dressing on it and i had everything else on the salad i honestly didn't notice so i think i think the shade cloth will will do your tomatoes well i'm thinking that shade cloth might solve a lot of problems more than i realized uh we're gonna get some probably 
if I don't invest in it this year, because it's kind of expensive. If I don't invest in it this year, I'm going to get some next year and we're going to cover the whole chicken run in it since we're planning to take the big cedar tree down that shades their run because it is not in good shape and is right next to the power line. Uh, so we're probably going to get them shade cloth next year. <laughs> and if it does well in the tomatoes, I might get some other other versions of it for something else too in the garden just I feel like the way that it's situated it gets full sun all day long literally from 9 a.m until 9 p.m so pretty much 12 hours of full sun that's a lot for anything living and they only really need like six half of that (laughs) yeah so they definitely get they get uh stressed out by it i think and it can't hurt to try it at least in my opinion so maybe it will be nice for me too (laughs) maybe we'll string some from the trellis to the chicken coop and just cover the whole garden (laughs) there you go shade michaela okay how about your squash because i know that you deal with just absolutely terrible uh levels of squash pests so what's the story with your squash this year i think i'm gonna re- be replanting some of it in the next couple days <laughs> i'll say that uh it was doing really well when we had all of that rain for the month and then it was starting to get a little bit sad uh i've kept up on the squash bug eggs but i have had to pull some plants because of the borers no matter what i do I actually, I I got this stuff that's like, it's kind of like a different version of like BT where it's like a, what is that? Like a bacteria or something like a, it's a specific organism thing that like deters them. And I got some of that to try, but so far it's not really working super well. Um, Maybe it's because they were already there, but I'm going to be replanting some of my squashes Some of them are doing fine. So it's definitely like half of them are doing okay and half of them are sad. My melons, all of them are doing just fine. None of those are sad whatsoever. I have one watermelon that's already the size of like two softballs. My cucumbers are doing fine. I haven't noticed any bugs on those, like squash bugs or anything like that. I've been pulling in a lot of cucumbers. I don't know the answer to this issue other than like my ducks definitely help. They go in there and they diggle their little heads around in the the grassy mulch and to try and get the the bugs, but they can only do so much. So I don't know, maybe next year I'll try covering them, but that requires me investing in a lot more uh hoops and things like that. The covers and I was really hoping to not have to do that. So that's that's the update. <laughs> they're they're a little sad. So for me and my squash, I mean, I struggle, but I don't think I struggle as much as you do. Um, the I think I think I'm not totally sure, but this is my hypothesis. I think that the vine borers are really what does mine in. You know, they'll they'll struggle with the squash bugs and the squash beetles and everything else, but I think. The nail in the coffin is the vine borers. So yep. my pumpkins, I did not cover this year because that would be so much space and so much infrastructure. So they're fending for themselves. I companion planted a little bit with the blue hubbard squash, which worked last year. Hopefully it'll work this year. But for my summer squash, I did put those under covers and also my melons. I have been unsuccessful with the cantaloupe family melons i've i've gotten some okay watermelons but the cantaloupe stuff i've i've just done terrible with and this is the first year that they are growing and that they look good because they're undercover but i'm kind of getting really tired of having to hand pollinate my squash because they bloom so quickly and then go away and then i'm having to track like okay did I pollinate that one? Because I have to take everything off and like shove my head in there and then get all in the squash plant, which is like spiky and whatever and itchy and like get in all this stuff to figure out if I've, if I've done it and then like do it. And then I get honestly not great 
rates of the fruit setting when I'm hand pollinating it versus, you know, I've never really had that issue when it was out in the open. So even though they're beautiful and pristine, I'm considering taking those covers off now because I think that the borer season is done. Um, that's usually June, or at least that's my perception of the season uh, where I am. But then I'm also like, if I take these covers off and then I come up here and my plants are dead, I'm going to be so, so mad at myself for risking that. I feel like you should take the covers off, but also plant more seeds at the same time. <laughs> and the, like right next to the ones that are currently there, you know? That's probably like, a that's, good plan. That's a bad idea. I completely blanked on summer squash. So what I was referring to was all my winter squashes and pumpkins. I, I also have nasturtiums planted. I planted a nasturtium in the same hole as all of my pumpkins and squashes. And then I also planted a nasturtium in between all of each, like each one of them. So it's like squash and nasturtium, nasturtium, squash and nasturtium, nasturtium, <laughs> like right next to each other. So that actually looks really pretty. I highly recommend. Um, even just for aesthetic, it looks really good. Summer squash. That's a whole nother topic. Those just got planted two days ago <laughs> because I had all of my garlic along the the super long trellis tunnel that we have on either side, the 24 foot beds. And so I just took all of that garlic out last week, finally, because we planted it so late. The garlic is a whole nother story we'll have to talk about sometime, but I need to plant it on time next year because it didn't do amazing this year. But that whole space, 48 feet worth, is filled with summer squash seeds of different varieties now. So hopefully those will come up soon if I keep watering them and uh, fill, fill that all out again and make me a jungle instead of having just like a whole bunch of empty looking beds. I'm at the point now where I need to plant something where I pulled my garlic out and I need to plant something where I pulled the onions out and then I'm presumably going to pull the potatoes soon. So I'll need to follow that with something. And I'm like, I just got the garden planted and I know that I should be a succession sowing green beans and, you know, summer squash plants and all these things. But also, <sighs> I don't, I don't know. I don't know if I have the heart. And then there's, after that, there's the fall garden and I'm definitely <laughs> burnt out then. Yeah, fall garden seeds need to start in like a month. Shh. Don't That's kind you of crazy. say those already, words. Those are dirty words. I, I already started ordering the seeds that I need for that and like trying to get that organized, but I'm not even done planting the main garden yet. So I would just see if I were you, what I would do for the potatoes is just be lazy about picking them all and leave some in there and let them regrow for a second crop. Check. Planted. There you go. Um, that bet's done. <laughs> I could do that. What are you putting in where your garlic was? Here's my plan, which is not necessarily going to happen. That's what I've told myself. <laughs> Disclaimer. That I'm going to follow the garlic with some flowers and some carrots. And then I'm going to follow the onions, which is basically a whole row, uh, with summer squash and green beans. And then I'll probably follow the potatoes with more potatoes because I have like I'll pull green potatoes or I have some potatoes in my cabinet from the store that sprouted and I can plant those. So I'll have, you know, a melange of the reject potatoes that are either going to get composted or I can just turn them into more potatoes. And the decision there is pretty easy. I just started a whole nother bed of reject potatoes as well. So that's the way to do it. Um, they're mixed in with my sweet potatoes. I did corn with sweet potatoes as a ground cover on one side of that bed. And then all my reject potatoes, uh, like my store-bought extras that were sprouting and just like extra little ones from stuff that we had just pulled out of the ground. So are you growing sweet potatoes? I am growing sweet potatoes. Yeah, I um. <laughs> I planted my sweet potatoes. So normally you grow them from slips, but I planted them like you plant potato potatoes with seed potatoes because 
I have the hardest time growing slips and I could buy them if I wanted to, but that's another $60 for 50 slips. And I had the potatoes and I was like, well, <laughs> it's going to be weird, but I'll do it. And I, I did that with a handful of them last year and it worked great. So I know that it works and I have my variety that I like and I'm sick of spending money. So that's what I did. Is it working? Yeah. <laughs> oh, good. I... I took a note from that, seeing that you did that. I planted all my slips, and then I also threw the potatoes in there and covered them up. And I was like, maybe they'll sprout more. So, I mean, why not? Yeah. <laughs> I, I wasn't going to do anything else with a potato. I figured I might as well throw it out there and see. I don't know about you, but, and I kind of mentioned this earlier, but for my tomatoes this year, I am having so many fungal issues. I feel like I'm going through every few days and picking leaves that are yellow that have those kind of like black gray spots on them and disposing of those leaves. I don't know if it's fusarium wilt or any of the other, there's like a whole family of uh, fungal issues and they all have crazy names and I don't remember the differences between all of them, but they all pretty much come from the same thing uh, and can be treated by similar things. Do you have that in your garden this year? So this is one of the, the trade-offs of the dry weather is my tomatoes don't have nearly as much disease as they did last year nice. yet. Because last spring when I had them planted, it was raining a lot and I was constantly clipping leaves off for that reason. This year, they're not really having any issues yet, but I did notice my first hornworm damage on the biggest tomato. So I just ordered a black light flashlight the other day. That should be here soon. And I'm going to go out there and nightlight and pick those guys and give them to my chickens for breakfast because middle finger to the hornworms. <laughs> those are my tomatoes. <laughs> Do you have other issues going on like pest wise besides the borers or the squash bugs? So with my summer squash plants being covered it seems like all of the pests that want to get to those are like fine i can't get to those i'm just gonna wreck your cucumbers so my cucumbers kind of had a rough go because they got knocked back with the hail and a lot of them got abused with that and i did restart cucumbers when i saw that but i kind of knew from you know starting cucumbers later in previous years that the ones that I start later just aren't going to do that great. And then they just have a lot more pest pressure this year because everything is, for some reason, getting redirected to those. So a lot of cucumber beetles, a lot of squash beetles, and some vine borer damage too, which I don't think I've ever seen vine borer damage on a cucumber before. That was new to me. I looked and I was like, really? So <laughs> I, I don't know. <laughs> Um, so I've only gotten a handful of cucumbers. They're very sad. And I'm just going to savor what I can get and um, not get emotionally attached to putting away a bunch of pickles this year. I've been surprised with how well my cucumbers have been doing. I only had one plant that took off initially because bugs ate every single other seedling. And that one's like six feet tall now and it's pumping out like a few cucumbers a day. It's a muncher. And those are my favorite ones. So I'm happy with that. I just planted a bunch more. But like you said, I'm not attached to that working. And I'm probably going to order more seeds so that I have a back stock of them. And I can plant more for fall time and see if that kind of works better. That's my game plan this year is to try and order extra seeds and just sow a bunch of random stuff for fall and see if any of that works <laughs> better than this this spring. <laughs> I will say every time I try cucumbers in the fall, they get like six inches tall and they kind of give up on life. I don't know if that's because, you know, I, I don't water my garden. So maybe they need more babying than I am just willing to give them. But every time that I've tried cucumbers in the fall, they suck. So I've kind of given up on them. Well, I'm already planning to redo peas, and those also need a lot of water, especially when it's hot out. So I figure if I'm already doing those, I might as well throw some cucumbers in that same trellis area and just, like, see if it works. 
because I have the seeds. And I, I have seeds for ones that I didn't really want to get. They're the ones that only get like two to four feet long, the vines. And I'm, I like the ones that climb a lot more. So I might just throw those on a trellis with my peas and just to use up the seeds and experiment with it and see if that works. I, we haven't talked about this, actually. My... I just replanted my green beans tonight for the second time because the deer and the bunnies keep coming in my garden for a midnight snack and eating them. So I completely weeded the bed. I left the green bean plants that are still sad and left there. I sewed four more rows in that bed and then I got a net, like an insect netting and low tunnel situation on there. So hopefully they'll leave that alone. And I will be resewing, or I just resewed my edamame bed for the third time because the dang bunnies and the deer have broken my low tunnel hoops twice. They didn't have netting on them yet. I just got the the hoops set up, and so I think they've got, gotten in the beds and then like got spooked or something and like got under the little fiberglass things and snapped them. Oh my gosh. So yeah, I I think that also the future deer fence situation for the garden might have to get moved up, if possible, because they weren't an issue last year, and I think maybe this year it's because we didn't plant our little sunflower field down below the garden, where they come from. That kind of distracted them last year, I think. And this year, they're just like all up in the garden. I literally walked outside yesterday to go weed that bed to flip it. And I'm like walking out to the garden. And I hear this loud rustling in the woods right next to the garden, like 30 feet from me. And I freaked out for one, because I was like, what's that? <laughs> and two, there's a little deer that just comes walking out of there and then like wanders down back into the forest below. I'm like, you were just eating these beans, weren't you? Like 10 minutes before I got out here, guaranteed. So, yeah. That is heartbreaking. That happened to me my first year. And that that was what spurred my deer fence. I had like 60 green bean plants and they had baby green beans on them. And it was literally like a couple days before I was going to harvest them. And the deer came. And just mowed half of them down. And I was like, all right, I'd like, screw this. I'm going to camp in the garden. I'm going to catch you and I'm going to scare you. And I'm going to let my dog like chase you and bark you, you know, out of here. Camped in the garden. Didn't hear anything all night. Neither did my dog. And woke up and the other half of the green beans was mowed. And I was like, all right. <laughs> <laughs> cool. Um, so I totally feel you on that. All right, before we close this episode out, we do want to get to a few questions. So we got on Instagram and asked you guys what some of your garden questions are, and these were some of the responses we got. So let's go through them. What are crops that can be planted in all seasons? That's kind of tricky. It, that's going to depend a little bit on where you are. You know, if you're in the north, you can probably carry greens through the entire year without doing without doing much. But, uh, you know, if you're in the South, you're going to have to move where they're planted in the, um, in the summer or do something like a shade cloth. But I mean, greens can be grown year round. It just depends on if you live somewhere really hot, you might have to give them some extra shade in the summer. If you live somewhere really cold, you might have to give them some extra shelter in the winter. There are things that aren't necessarily planted year round, but you could plant in both the spring and the fall, like brassicas, greens, peas, like I said, I was going to try cucumbers, carrots, all sorts of stuff can be planted at least twice a year. You can get two seasons out of your, your growing year, I guess, uh, depending on where you're located. The next one is trying to decide if I should build another garden. Should I? I feel like we all know what our answer to that. And that's absolutely. Um, we will we will happily you enable have... you. The answer is yes. The answer is always yeah. yes. All right. I feel like that was an easy one. <laughs> <laughs> have you eaten a hot garden tomato yet? For one, that triggers my sensory issues. But <laughs> I will still answer it. 
The answer is yes, but it was a cherry tomato. So I don't know if that really counts for your question. Because I, f- I feel like your question is, you know, the big heirloom, like bite into it like an apple garden tomato. And the answer to that is no. And Michaela's cringing. <laughs> yeah. The answer to this for me is I'm going to throw up <laughs> at the thought of this. I have I have goosebumps. Um, thinking about biting into a tomato, um, just you know, un- unadulterated tomato. <laughs> Do not like best things to grow for beginners. I want to start learning to can soon as well. We have a whole episode on this. We'll link that episode below, but it should be somewhere on our YouTube and or Spotify lists if you are listening to this there. Yeah, this really just depends. I think honestly the best thing for you to grow as a beginner is the food that you like to eat. That would be my best suggestion. Yeah, and the only thing that I'll add to that is if you're looking to venture into canning, I personally think that canning tomatoes is a great thing to learn on and it's something that, you know, is super popular anyway. So if you're looking to lean more into like the production homestead side of things, I would say maybe go with tomatoes. How do you find the motivation to keep it all up and going? Um, my mental health is not solid. <laughs> there's, there's multiple reasons for that. Uh, I don't, I don't know if my life choices are enviable or should be replicated, but they are what they are. There are living things that depend on us. And we don't have a choice. (laughs) Is that a good enough answer? (laughs) Yeah. I mean, neither of us have children, but we Mm. have a whole lot of animals and those are living creatures. So like, you don't have a choice. They need fed, they need watered. And as far as like all of the other stuff we have going on, that's the stuff that gives me energy. Like YouTube things as exhausting as it can be, it also like feeds my creative energy at the same time. So if I didn't have that, I probably wouldn't enjoy doing all of the other things nearly as much because that's, that's part of the reason I enjoy it is being able to document it and like, make creative things out of it. Yeah, that's fair. I mean, jokes rooted in truth aside, (laughs) um, like this This is something that for both of us, we just, we deeply enjoy it. And, you know, having that sort of love for it kind of is the only thing that can push you forward, especially when you have huge gardens, because if you don't have that passion for it, it's just not going to be sustainable. And that's okay. Yeah, it's a, it's a nice little cocktail of neurodivergence, necessity and passion, I would say. (laughs) <laughs> sure okay. good concise way to put that <laughs> how many heirloom tomatoes are produced by a single plant I had to look this up I have absolutely no clue it really depends on your garden it really depends on your growing season your situation what kind of tomato there are so many factors uh, but Google says 20 pounds so we'll go with that And for the record, you know, heirloom tomato, when we say that, we think of those really, really big, really colorful and sometimes uh, fluted tomatoes that you find at the grocery store. But heirloom actually has to do with the genetics of the seed. So you can technically have an heirloom cherry tomato that's going to give you potentially hundreds of tomatoes, or you can have a variety that gives you really, really huge tomatoes, but because the fruit is so big, it's going to give you fewer of them. So it depends on a lot of things. It even depends on how you prune it. Like there are so many different variations of an answer to that specific question. Are either of you using rainwater collection to water? I am not. I don't currently have a rainwater collection system. I've thought about it, and it seems like a great idea, but it's just not a project that I have had the dopamine to execute yet. We should, whenever you expand your little run and shed up in the garden, put a gutter on that and install a rainwater catchment. You read my mind. That is exactly my plan. (laughs) (laughs) I'm always thinking. (laughs) 
uh, we have the totes to do it. We have to clear the area of poison ivy and downed trees and whatnot to be able to put them there. So we haven't gotten around to that yet, but like I said earlier in this episode, that might be moved up as a priority because of the weather situation we've had this year so far. Is your mulch working? Which mulch? <laughs> my pathway mulch is mostly Bermuda grass. And my garden bed mulch, I would say, has definitely made a huge difference this year. I still do not love the wood chips in my garden beds. I will say that. Not a fan. They're still a pain in the butt to move around, and I hate accidentally mixing them in. Short answer is, yes, my mulch is working, but it kind of depends on which mulch. I have wood chip mulch, I have straw, and I have hay. So the wood chip mulch, I think, is working fantastically. And by working, I mean weed suppression, moisture retention, and building good quality soil. So for for the latter two, for the moisture retention and building soil, all of the mulch is working great. For the weed suppression, the wood chip mulch is working well. It's not perfect, but it's working really well. Um, for the hay and the straw, the weeds are poking through and I'm already like, no, I just mulched it. <laughs> now I've got to maintain it. And that's why I like using wood chip mulch, but I just got sick of lugging it. Do you have the invasion of Japanese beetles? I actually hadn't thought about that until this question, but I have seen Japanese beetles for the first time on my property. They're in my flower garden and they're eating some of my zinnias. So they're not totally an issue, but they are causing some cosmetic damage on some of the flowers. We had them pretty bad last year on all of our wild blackberries. And a little bit in the garden on the edamame. Right now, since the edamame got eaten by the bunnies, we don't have any in the garden. But they are on our orchard trees a little bit. So we actually just ordered some of the bait traps for them so that we can kind of collect them and then just feed them to the chickens. Uh, what are you planting in your fall gardens? I feel like I've talked about this a little bit this episode. But cucumbers, peas. I'm going to try brassicas again. I'm going to plant garlic and onions. I'm going to try some fall onions. I'm probably forgetting things. Maybe some oh, kale, kale is a brassica. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. I think that's it. I'm not mentally prepared for this question. Uh, and I'm very stressed now that I'm thinking about it. <laughs> but I'm going to, yeah, do the normal round of brassicas that the chickens inevitably break in and eat every single year. Um, now that I have that insect netting that I can see through, that's not Agrabon and it's not the greenhouse plastic, maybe, maybe, <laughs> maybe that'll be a different story. But yeah, I'll grow some broccoli that won't do anything and some Brussels sprouts that also won't do anything and some Napa cabbage that also won't do anything is what I'll grow in my fall garden. <laughs> She'll grow good intentions. Mm-hmm. Yep. <laughs> What if your garden seems like it's just not growing? What do you do? I think that compost pretty much solves everything when it comes to the garden. Um, of course, that's going to depend on your particular conditions. You know, like for us right now, where it's incredibly hot and it's incredibly dry, maybe the issue isn't nutrients. Maybe the issue is is that there's just not enough water available. So it kind of it kind of depends, but truly compost is not gonna hurt if you throw it on your plants i pinky promise it's a really good answer to that my answer was just gonna be what i do and what i've been doing and that is keep watering it and try not to panic <laughs> <laughs> and uh potentially if you were planning to use that food to like put up for the winter or whatever like canning preserving potentially start looking at one other sources to get that food so that you can still get in-season produce and put it up for the winter or to start figuring out what of that you could either restart or get at like get new plants new seedlings at a local place or what you can replant and do in a fall garden instead if you think it's not going to rebound but uh, I would just keep watering and try not to panic as step one how often are you watering 
right now I am watering every single day and I try to do like half the garden in the morning. Like when I go out there to feed the birds and stuff, I'll get it on the bed and, you know, move it around while I'm out there a little bit. And then in the evening, I'm usually out there for a lot longer. So I'll do however much I have left of it. But typically, I would not water unless it's been a couple or a few days without a good rain. And right now, that's pretty much all the time. So every day. My answer is different. So normally, I only water after I transplant things. So my normal uh, mode of operation is I start everything indoors. I don't direct sow because I don't like watering a bunch. And when you direct sow, you kind of have to water a bunch. So I will water things in up to the week after I've transplanted stuff. And then I mulch it really heavily. And then I say, good luck. Now, there are exceptions to that, like the weather that we've had lately where it's been in the 90s and it hasn't rained for what seems like a year. Um, It's obviously an exaggeration. But recently, with this extreme weather that we've had, I was watering twice a week, maybe. And that was, again, that dinky little sprinkler head for um, the section that it covers, you know, let it get a good soak. I prefer to do a deep watering. I think frequent shallow watering is going to do more harm than good. But if you give your garden a deep soak, you know, I let that go for at least a few hours and then I'll move it to the other side of the garden, give that another deep soak for another few hours. That's what I've been doing for the last little bit. It kind of, it it depends on what your soil is like, what your what your situation is really like for me, I can't leave the sprinkler in one area for more than a half hour or the clay here starts puddling up. So I do have to move it every 30 minutes or so. And I just try and do it more consistently. So it's getting a good long watering, but it's not, you know, it's not getting five minutes of water and then moving around. It's still getting a decent bit, but it's not puddling up there and drowning anything. (laughs) What are you most excited to harvest? I'm going to let you answer this one first. (laughs) I think if I can get melons this year, like especially cantaloupe melons, I think I'll be really excited about that uh, just because I've had so many issues with them previously. But also, I'm kind of cheating because I have two answers. Uh, I'm also really excited about the new flower garden that I have because I love growing flowers. I just was prioritizing the space for food previously. So I think the hopefully buckets and buckets of flowers that I'm going to be able to pull in this year is going to be really, really fun. Are you going to save like dry flowers and try and use them in like soaps or anything this year? Oh, God. (laughs) Do I need another project? Um, (laughs) I am. I am growing calendula. I actually need to sow a little bit more of it. Um, But (laughs) beyond that, no. I was just curious. I'm going to try and get soap making stuff for fall, like to do that over this winter. And I saved some of our lavender to try and do that. And I might try and save some of our, our other flowers too. My answer to this question is a plant that I don't even have the seeds for yet. (laughs) So I was shopping for fall seeds and I came across this like online exclusive little pumpkin on botanical interest and it's called a black cat pumpkin and it's like a small pumpkin. It's like acorn squash. It looks like an acorn squash, but it's like literally like the stem and everything is black and it is so cute. So those seeds shipped yesterday (laughs) and as soon as they get here I'm putting them in the ground and hoping that I can actually harvest that this year which I should be able to because they're a small pumpkin and we have a long season if I can keep the bugs off of them but if that doesn't work out I think what I'll be most excited for is harvesting some of our more unique peppers like we're trying the Jimmy Nardello this year those ones they're starting to get their fun little shapes on them and they're they're decent sized already. And then we have a few others like the lunchbox and whatnot. So some of those fun little peppers that I haven't tried before, 
I am very excited for. I'm also really sad that I thought I had shishito peppers growing and I do not. So I might have to try and get some from Lowe's or something because I'm pretty bummed that I somehow messed that up. How do you get money or sponsors for your garden? I don't know. I don't have <laughs> I don't have any sponsors and no one pays me pays me vanity garden. Uh but if you do know, let me know. <laughs> yeah, I'm not really sure what this question is asking specifically. I feel like it has to be in regards to like our content creation. But neither of us are like sponsored by anybody. I've had two sponsored videos on YouTube ever. One was for Chick Cozy and one was for our birch mattress. And neither of those are really garden things. Um, I have people reach out. We both have people reach out all the time. Companies, but they're just not really companies that we feel super, I don't know, motivated to work with. Like they, they don't, some of them aren't really garden or homestead related things at all. Like I've mentioned before, like e-bikes, I get e-bike emails all the time. And just random things like that. I would love to work with more brands. Like, I don't have any issue working with a brand that I actually like. There are a handful that if they asked, like, if they reached out, I would absolutely say yes. Like, uh, Greenstock and, I don't know, kitchen, like, kitchen tool things. Like, name brands, though. I don't want Amazon brand stuff, honestly. So, yeah. I guess the answer is be a, like, my answer truly would be to be a more more consistent with like social media posting and like really building a following because that's what brands want to see and you actually have to pitch yourself to brands usually if you want them to work with you we kind of have like the youtube situation which is social media but not the same as other social media and so brands will see our channels and reach out to us but it's really just random brands that for the most part, are reaching out to probably hundreds of people a day and just trying to get someone to say yes to them. So, like, you can really tell when there's a brand who, like, really actually wants to work with you specifically. That's kind of just where we're at. Neither of us really do a lot of brand sponsorships or anything because, honestly, it takes a lot of work to do those. And what we do already takes a lot of work. So, I mean, I'm not complaining. I enjoy it, but it is a lot of work. So if there are any uh, gardening brands that you know of that you want us to be sponsored by, reach out to them and tell them about us. <laughs> be our cheerleaders. <laughs> I mean, and that can easily go into a larger conversation of like, the, I think, and I was guilty of this as a viewer, as a, as a, consumer of you know youtube videos and things i think there's this perception that like if you're monetized on youtube that you make a bunch of money and you have you know brands sponsoring you all the time and there are people who make a bunch of money and have brands sponsoring them all the time but that's not inherent in getting monetized i mean we've both been monetized for a while now and make Michaela, you make more money than I do. Um, I'm happy if I make the bare minimum to get the <laughs> the money even transferred to my account from YouTube. All right, that is all of our questions. We are going to turn one of these back on you guys, though. We want to know what are you most excited to harvest from your garden this year? Thanks for joining us on this episode of She Said Homestead. We hope you enjoyed our chat. Before we say goodbye, we'd love to hear from you. Send your homesteading stories to us at shesaidhomestead at gmail.com. We can't wait to share them on the air. To stay connected, follow us on Instagram for updates and sneak peeks at what's coming up next. If you like video podcasts, make sure you subscribe to the She Said Homestead YouTube channel too. We can't thank you enough for being part of the She Said Homestead community. Until next time, happy homesteading.